Sure. Uh, hi. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, first of all, thank you to Professor Arel for uh, inviting me to uh, step in in this panel, which is uh, uh, an opportunity to share today. But um, uh, also just for you to know that this was not foreseen that I would speak uh, today nor in this panel. So I've reflected on the subject uh, ra rather on short notice. Um, and uh, le let me start where I want to end. Uh, I brought and I put at the back table a report that I was a principal advisor on and initiated um, called an independent legal analysis of the Russian Federation's breaches of the Genocide Convention in Ukraine and the duty to prevent. And it's the duty to prevent I want to really talk about. Uh, but that's where I'm going to end up my remarks. I'm going to start with memory and, uh, and history. Um, by way of briefly introducing myself, I'm a associate professor of law uh, here at the University of Ottawa. I, I hold a professorship in international conflict resolution. I'm director of the Human Rights Research and Education Center. But I have a career as an international civil servant. I investigated gross violations of human rights for the United Nations for 10 years in a lot of different places, Iraq, uh, Myanmar, and so forth. Uh, and then I was, uh, for nine years, I was the legal advisor and then the first director of the Office of the High Commission on National Minorities of the OSCE. Uh, so I negotiated in the mid-1990s and the 2000s um, agreements between Russia and Ukraine, uh, the first constitution of Ukraine, the first constitution of Crimea, many, many other things. The first agreement between uh, Kushma and Yeltsin, 1997. So we can talk about all those things. Uh, but that I'm not, I grew up in Winnipeg, uh, not from a Ukrainian background or family, found myself in Europe doing a lot of different things. So my, my, I'm informed by that experience is what I want to say, and a long and still ongoing contact with, with Ukraine. My first professional, in my first professional experience, uh, not investigating human rights violations, but working on inter-ethnic relations, mainly in Eastern Europe, um, uh, was the phenomenon that almost everywhere I went, uh, my interlocutors began with a history lesson. And they said two things. They said, that usually, usually a long history lesson. <laughs> I had to sit patiently and go through, you know, Kosovo, Poya Kosovo, and, you know, 14, whatever it was, and the battle against, uh, you know, the, the Ottomans and whatever. And, you know, after listening for a long time, that's the first thing is that that's our history, right? The history almost determines, right? Second thing is, and you don't understand, you know, because I'm a foreigner, right? What the hell do I understand? And, you know, and uh, adjunct of the you don't understand is, and we're special. Our history is unique, you know, so kind of keep all the general lessons of the world, you know, we're telling you, and so forth. So um, uh, I've thought about that further. I mean, that's true in all of our societies. We have our own formal uh, articulations of memory and history and our myths. There's no society in the world that doesn't have them, whether it's 1066 in, in the UK, uh, you know, and, uh, and, and let me just say in this regard, uh, regarding museums and so forth, I don't know if you're aware, at the Canadian Museum of Human Rights, you know, the controversy over genocide, and specifically the order, the instruction from the Har our democratic government under Prime Minister Harper that the word genocide could not be used for indigenous peoples in Canada, and specifically indigenous history could not be included in the, in the exhibition on genocide. Prohibited. Instruction from the PMO. So much for our, you know, I mean, we can talk about that. But just to say, why? Because, because there's an official narrative, right? There's a c connection to these things. And these things are always constructed. Uh, I, I would go further than that to talk about, as people like Helen Caldicott and other interesting psychiatrists and, and, and uh, um, uh, uh, pediatricians and others have talked about uh, mass psychosis, uh, you know, the issue of healing and, and hurt and how societies deal with these things and why memory in museums and things are, why remembering is important. Uh, I want to come to the Genocide Convention because it is synonymous in most of our minds with the phrase never again. And I want to come talk about that. But let's just talk for a moment a bit more about, about uh, memory and history. You might have noted that the uh, Nobel Peace Prize was, among other organizations, given to Memorial Society. Memorial Society legally doesn't exist in Russia anymore. December 2021, it was uh, uh, um, what's the word? Uh, liquidated, thank you. Yeah, it existed from 1989 to 2021. Formally, it was created with Sakharov in 1987. Uh, last week, Friday, I don't know the outcome, maybe you know, but there was a court case in Moscow to expropriate the building. So they're, they're, they're trying to erase every element of Memorial, its, its proprietary elements, its collections, and, and so forth. 
um, you know, why, why is this? What, what is the fixation on this, right? Uh, well, you might also be looking at what President Xi in uh, China is doing. Uh, the elimination, the active policy of elimination of Tiananmen Square. Uh, all um, uh, in, in, uh, in um, Hong Kong, uh, something like 400 uh, monuments have been uh, taken down. Uh, it's been removed from all. I spoke with a young Chinese guy just last week, a Chinese student in Canada, and he mentioned to me, he just volunteered to me, he said, you know, my mother was a student in Tiananmen in 1989. You know, some people have memory through family, but systematically, society-wise, it's fairly easy to eliminate these things. Uh, so memory, uh, I I you know, and, and the preoccupation on this, and sometimes called mass repression, uh, is very important. Uh, one of the things that Sakharov did in 1990, very importantly, I don't know if it still exists or if any of you have seen it, I've never seen it, but he went to uh, the, uh, a gulag uh, camp in uh, uh, Solovetsky and brought back a rock, a st it's called the Solovetsky stone, but it's a rock, it's a big rock. We'd recognize in Canada, it's granite, you know, a big chunk of granite. Uh, and, uh, and brought it back and he put it in Lubyanka uh, uh, Square in front of the now FSB, former KGB building. Why? A, a chunk of rock, you know? Because it was that chunk of rock in the camp, in the gulag, the symbolic importance of this and the connection to memory and responsibility is, is uh, very significant. Now, m importantly, Memorial Society, which began essentially to archive and, and uh, in fact, its, its formal terms would uncover the crimes of the Stalinist regime and, to, and the experiences of the victims of the Gulag, it expanded its activity fairly, re uh, fairly uh, soon after to go beyond archiving and memory to education and, importantly, to human rights promotion. And they extended it beyond uh, 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 the form, uh, Russia and the former Soviet Union to a number of other countries, uh, particularly in Eastern Europe. In 2005, uh, in the institution I used to be director of, uh, the OSCE High Commission on National Minorities, we awarded the Max van der Stoel, who was the first High Commissioner Prize, uh, uh, focused on preventive action to Memorial. And we were one of the rare organizations that insisted on using the full title of Memorial Society, which is almost never used. People call it Memorial or Memorial Society. But I want to read you the full title. This, is, this was the incorporated title. Memorial International Historical Enlightenment, comma, Human Rights and Humanitarian Society. It wasn't just memory. Enlightenment. Human Rights Humanitarian. And the commendation for that award were read in part, uh, it was awarded for the broad scope of work to include collection and dissemination of information about ethnic discrimination in the OSCE area. Now, never again as a concept you might know uh, came out of a, a, a Jewish poet's poem in 1927. Uh, that actually was about uh, Masada, and it was uh, uh, the poem was titled "Never Again Shall Masada Fall." But uh, in, uh, by the prisoners who left Buchenwald, they invoked the poem, and this is where "Never Again" comes from as a phrase. Uh, and they invoked it though as an anti-fascist phrase. It wasn't just about the Holocaust; it was an anti-fascism phrase. "Never Again," not just "We will be victims." "Never Again" will we tolerate will we participate in, and no, no one else sh should, essentially the fascistic uh, uh, political project. That's what that was about. That was picked up by people like uh, Raphael Lemkin. And Lemkin in the Genocide Convention, in, 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 which gave rise to the Genocide Convention, he's often called the father of the Genocide Convention, is not the Genocide Convention we know today. Lemkin was against genocide I mean, which was just basically the idea of homicide, but for a genus against population. But also political genocide. Not only uh, uh, racial or national or religious or uh, ethnic, but political and, and not just cultural. Uh, but he absolutely, by the way, was against cultural and linguistic genocide too. Uh, it's the states that didn't pick it up. But he was against political genocide. If you target a group of people for who they are or, or, or the character of their being, this and, and seek to eliminate them as such, that's what is odious. That is what uh, is connected. So never again is articulated in this sense as an imperative, as an injunction to political projects, essentially. 
the Genocide Convention is a treaty. It's also a special kind of a treaty because it incorporates what many jurists would say is also a customary international standard, that is to say, one that state practice and the belief of states in the legal obligation also confirms that you're not allowed to do this. It's a general prohibition. More than that, it's often called a peremptory norm. Uh, the Latin phrase is use, co use cogens, which you might see. Thank you very much. And use cogens is, um, thank you, is just the Latin phrase uh, for peremptory norm. And a peremptory norm, uh, basically in the hierarchy of norms, says that this supersedes other norms. It can never be derogated from, it comes before and above. It's not preemptory, it's peremptory, it's a, it's a norm. And the importance of this is to say that it is foundational, and there are no exceptions to it. Uh, you know, China right now with the Uyghurs is trying to make an exception. They don't, they're, they're a state party of the Genocide Convention. They don't deny they're a state party. Their argument is, we have a justification. We're working on terrorists that are using terrorist uh, means for separation and so on. Sorry, there are no excuses or exceptions for Genocide Convention. Straightforward uh, matter. Uh, so what's important about the, this never again in the Genocide Convention, however, uh, is that it is an active term it, with an implied verb, an active obligation. It's comprehensive in scope, and it's an obligation of result. It's not give it your best try. It's there shall be never again genocide. It's the outcome that we're seeking for. Uh, this is not a matter of an ex post facto Admonition, oh, gotcha, you committed it, and now we're gonna spank you, put you in jail or whatever. But let me immediately draw the importance here of the Genocide Convention. The Genocide Convention is not putting someone in jail. It's, it's an injunction against states. You can't arrest a state, you can't put a state in jail. You can't even prosecute a state. If you, if you read about that, then the person doesn't know what the hell they're talking about. In international law, there's no such thing as prosecuting a state, because there's no supranationality. So you, you can bring, for example, as Russia brought Ukraine, ironically, to the International Court of Justice, and now there's a, a retort from, from Ukraine and many other states uh, at the International Court of Justice. It's not a prosecution. It's a dispute resolution. Explicitly, it must be. But what the question is, is who has breached this convention? But I don't want to talk about that. That's the ex post facto element. Article one of the Genocide Convention, which is the essence of it, and in the god darn title of the convention, which is the Convention on the Prohibition and Prevention of Genocide, is this never again idea. And article one is the obligation of states as a duty to prevent. You don't prevent ex post facto, you prevent in advance of. The obligation is more than uh, a freestanding obligation, it has implications. The obligations are, and I'll just say a few of them, to take steps, to act preventively to the extent of one's capacities in proximity to the risks. The International Court of Justice has expounded on this and said that this duty to prevent begins at the moment a state knows or ought to know that there is a serious risk of genocide. You don't wait until later, it's a risk analysis. We, we do the same if you, if you have fire insurance on your home. The risk is, is a preventive risk. You get it because there's a risk something might happen, and your duties, by the way, even legally, otherwise your, your insurance policy won't pertain, is you're supposed to act reasonably yourself to prevent a fire. Now, there's a wonderful little insurance company in Manitoba, by the way, called Wawanisa, and they used to give, with their fire insurance policies, a fire extinguisher that they would come in and install in kitchens because the largest number of risks of fire in homes were kitchen fires. And you know what? The Wawanisa, which is a mutual, didn't want claims. Really smart company. And they become very successful and large by reducing claims. They acted preventively against known risks. The International Court of Justice and the High Commission on National Minorities uh, acted as institutions of prevention at the earliest stage. And the Genocide Convention as a treaty requires positive undertakings by states with regard to state responsibility. And what, that's different than individual responsibility. It doesn't mean you go to jail or a prosecutor. State responsibility is the idea that a state may be held responsible by, by other states, including subject to countermeasures for its breaches and, for example, reparations, many other things. Not after the genocide occurs. Remember, we're talking Article One. 
duty to prevent. Uh, and also, the possibilities, even if you were to go to the International Court of Justice to seek what are called provisional measures before things start. Um, I'll come to my conclusion now. What are the, what are the lessons from this in memory? Uh, you know, the, the insights and with introspection to look at what are the experiences, whether it's the First World War, the Second World War. We know the First World War. You know, what, one of the basic memories is that retributive justice is a bad idea. Don't slap giant reparations uh, on, on the Germans. Don't ridicule them. I don't know if you're aware, but if, you, if it's still on video, you can see, the historians can see, you know, how the German generals were trotted into Versailles and were literally ridiculed. And if you, know, if you read Mein Kampf, 1924, uh, the first 100 pages of Mein Kampf is basically a story about how the Germans were badly treated after the First World War, led into this narrative you know, of, of we were badly done by and we're gonna goddamn get our, our due. We learned that's a bad way. We also learned that the interlocking treaties on minority protection of the interwar period first after the League of Nations, not a good idea, not sufficient. You've gotta look at the causes, the individuals and effects not just between states. We learned that Chamberlain in 1938 made a giant mistake. We learned those things. So after the Second World War, we adopted a UN Charter and we said you can't use force to settle your disputes. You can't just take territory, so we know what that means now in the current context. You have, you have to go through uh, legal means. But we also learned, very important, that human rights must be respected everywhere, always. This is a foundational, a radical change in global history. UN Charter. And we learned that you have to act preventively and early. And human rights include minority rights. This is extremely important. What, what we've, now I'm bringing you to the end of my remarks, I've provided this report. It's on the back tables. There's a full English copy. Uh, it, online it exists in about six or eight translations, including Ukrainian, Russian. We have 12 or 14 uh, summaries, I brought French and Ukrainian summaries, executive summaries, if you'd like them. Uh, but the essence of it is that, uh, and I won't spend time now summarizing it, there were many, many things that could have and should have been done far before the 24th of February uh, 2022. And there are many things that could have and should be done now before waiting for some ICJ decision in the, I'm in favor of an ICJ decision, but just for you to know, and, and the idea that we're going to arrest someone and prosecute them sometime, and then we're all going to be, you know, kosher, <laughs> is mythology. Just not true. Uh, and, and so we have to look at what could be done. And if you look at uh, these possibilities, you know, I bring it back, and this is my uh, real conclusion, is what is it about us? Us sitting in this room, but also in Canada. Because... Um, there's very little you and I can do you know, about the Kremlin, for example, at the moment. But what we can ask ourselves is, what about us? And Canada is a state party to the Genocide Convention. We are under a duty to prevent. Our country is. And the first thing with insight and introspection is to be honest. Did we not see this? Did we, we, were we unaware? Were we caught unaware? Is our government that and our society that poor? We didn't see it coming? What did we do? What could we do? There are many things we could and still can do that fall in legal terms under the duty to prevent, countermeasures, uh, all sorts of things. Never mind diplomacy. We must do this with intention and, and with a feeling of, of strong conviction because in a lot of parts of the world, people are not as free and able as we are. And that's what I would just like to conclude by saying we can we should, we must. Thank you very much. Thank you so much.